Good morning and welcome to worship. We're so glad you could join us this morning. And uh, my name is Pastor Matt West, and I'd like to take a moment to introduce my uh, colleagues here this morning. So uh, on the screen uh, to my left is uh, Pastor Matt. And uh, to the right, I have Pastor Curtis. And then uh, below me, uh, I see Pastor Kim, Pastor Andrea, Pastor Jackie, Pastor Heather, and Pastor Katie. Uh, if you're watching on Facebook, then we encourage you to host a watch party so others may join us too. Otherwise, after service is over, be sure to share the video to help us connect with those outside of our congregations. Also, please be sure to leave us a like or some other reaction so we know who we're worshiping with today. My friends and I would like to take a moment as well to thank those who continue to give during this time apart. Please be sure to share your offering gifts with those options that your local congregation has made available for you. One last reminder, uh, be sure to check your local church's Facebook page and your email for updates and opportunities to connect during the week. Today we enter week two of our May series, Closer and Closer, so again, we welcome you to worship. In honor of Mother's Day, this morning we offer for our call to worship the wide spectrum of mothering. To those who gave birth this year, to their first child, we celebrate with you. To those who lost a child this year, we mourn with you. To those who are in the trenches with little ones every day and wear the badge of food stains, we appreciate you. To those who experience loss through miscarriage, failed adoptions, or running away, we mourn with you. To those who walk the hard path of infertility, fraught with pokes, prods, tears, and disappointment, we walk with you. Forgive us when we say foolish things, we don't mean to make this harder than it is. And to those who are fat foster moms, mentor moms, and spiritual moms, we need you. <clears throat> to those who have warm and close relationships with your children, we celebrate with you. To those who have disappointment, heartache, and distance with your children, we sit with you. To those who lost their mothers this year, we grieve with you. To those who experienced abuse at the hands of your own mother, we acknowledge your experience. To those who lived through driving tests, medical tests, and overall tests of motherhood, we are better for having you in our midst. To those who have aborted children, we remember them and you on this day. <clears throat> to those who are single and long to be married and mothering your own children, we mourn that life has not turned out the way you longed for it to be. To those who step parent, we walk with you on these complex paths. To those who envisioned lavishing love on grandchildren, yet that dream is not to be, we grieve with you. <clears throat> to those who will have empty your nest in the upcoming year, we grieve and rejoice with you. To those who place children up for adoption, we commend you for your selflessness and remember how you hold that child in your heart. And to those who are pregnant with new life, both expected and even surprising, we anticipate with you. This Mother's Day, we walk with you. Mothering is not for the faint of heart, and we have real warriors in our midst. We remember you. My hope is filled on nothing less than Jesus' blood.
face. I rest on His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the grave. and love, we gather together in different ways this morning, from computer screens, from telephones, car radios, we gather, reaching out across the wires, waving from a safe distance to come together as a community of faith. From living room to front porch to car seat, we gather as we are able ready to be of service to each other, to the world, ready to build communities of hope and love as we face this bright morning. We are apart, but we are together, offering our love, our commitment, our hope, and our prayers in service to one another and to this world. May we be like living stones built into a spiritual house. It is a new way but an old way as we come together in worship today. Amen. Good morning. This morning we are in the book of First Peter, the New Testament book of First Peter, in the first 10 verses. And this morning I will be reading out of the message, uh, paraphrase of this chapter, 1 through 10. So clean house, make a clean sweep of malice and pretense, envy and hurtful talk. You've had a taste of God. Now, like infants at the breast, drink deep of God's pure kindness. Then you'll grow up mature and whole in God. Welcome to the living stone, the source of life. The workman took one look and threw it out. God set it in the place of honor. Present yourselves as building stones for the construction of a sanctuary vibrant with life, in which you'll serve as holy priests, offering Christ-approved lives up to God. The scriptures provide precedent. Look, I'm setting a stone in Zion, a cornerstone in the place of honor. Whoever trusts in this stone as a foundation will never have cause to regret it. To you who trust him, He's a stone to be proud of, but to those who refuse to trust him, the stone the workmen threw out is now the chief foundation stone. For the untrusting, it's a stone to trip over, 
a boulder blocking the way. They trip and fall because they refuse to obey just as predicted. But you are the ones chosen by God, chosen for the high calling of priestly work, chosen to be a holy people, God's instruments to do his work and speak out for him, to tell others of the night and day difference he made for you, from nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. Thank you for that reading today, uh, Pastor Kim. As we begin to um, have this conversation and go around and hear from some different voices and perspective, I'd like to uh, sort of start things off today by uh, the scripture that we read in the message today from First Peter chapter 2 has a lot of imagery of stones and building. Does anyone want to lean into sort of starting us off of why uh, this the author might be using this imagery of stones to gather the attention of the early church? Sure. Um, you know, it's, it is an, a, a really interesting way for us to look at ourselves. And I think as the, the hearers of this letter were maybe even challenged by it, uh, but there are some connections to their faith um, you know, they're asked to be, and, and they're reminded, and they're brought into this sameness of Jesus. You know, Jesus is referred to as the living stone, rejected by men, but then chosen by God. And, and this is the same invitation that, 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 that they're given as well. And, you know, if we look throughout uh, the narrative of, of Scripture, um, stones are nothing new. Um, Stones have, again, this, this recurring image uh, from, from, from the very beginning of, of Scripture. There, you know, stones were used to, to mark an encounter with God. Uh, af after Jacob wrestled with the angel, um, he, he creates an altar out of stones. Uh, we, we hear it in our hymns, you know, uh, Come thou font of every blessing, here I raise mine Ebenezer. And Ebenezer was this marking of this encounter with God. Uh, stones were used for to build homes and to build fortresses and walls. Uh, David, <laughs> we know, used the stone to, to slay the giant, beginning his reign as, as Israel's greatest king. Uh, stones are the sites of wells. Uh, again, the sites, the, they're made from altars. Uh, Moses was able to draw water from a stone. Um, We've just come from the event of Easter and Good Friday where the, the tomb was sealed with a stone, with a giant stone, with a, with a rock. And so, um, and we also are reminded in Scripture, too, of stones being used as a way to impact and to, to hurt people. Uh, Stephen, one of, one of the disciples, was stoned to death. Uh, the Apostle Paul was believed to have been a part of that. Um, when Jesus intercedes for the woman on, on her behalf, she is about to be stoned by the community for her um, believed actions. And so um, when they hear, I have to believe that when they hear stones, uh, they have this image that comes to mind. But I think there's more to the story that, that goes on because Peter uh, reminds them of, of who he is as well, I think. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of imagery that we would identify ourselves with as the listeners here, and it puts us in that, in that place. Because we realize in the Old Testament and throughout Scripture, even the New Testament, the imagery of stones, one of the best ways we can sort of relate that to today, you know, in this, this day that we're gathering together for worship, is often by illustration or story. And Jackie, I believe that you have a, a story to share with us that centers around stones and the events in your life. Do you want to share that with us today? Sure. Thanks for asking. Um, Living in Gladwin, we were surrounded by Amish neighbors, and it was just fun this time of year because everybody was out, you know, plowing the fields, and, and you notice, like, behind the plows with the horses, there was always a wagon that was being pulled behind, and you saw the kids out in the fields as well, and the kids were out there gathering boulders, gathering rocks, gathering, you know, the things that would get in the way, and, and uh, you know, of course, me being the Florida girl moving into this town and kept that why why you know why are we collecting rocks what's the purpose of that and you know the obvious of well it's going to get in the way of the crops you know it's going to get in the way of 
of the plant. So they would collect, I mean, wagons full of boulders and rocks, and they were all of different sizes, and they were all just full of the soil, and just, just, they were, you know, not perfectly round, they were just all different shapes and that. And it was just um, interesting how they would unload certain stones, rocks, on the porch, they would wash them off and, and they would just um, kind of be disgusted with the ones that just had like the knobs on the side and were, you know, were that perfect round, perfect shape kind. And, and it was just kind of funny just to watch them with these rocks because they really like checked them over these rocks. And then they'd wash them all off, get the dirt off of them. And, and then you would see the girls a couple days later out with paint buckets and they would be painting the rocks and they would, um, bright colors, pink, green, purple. I mean, these vibrant colors, they would paint them. And of course I had to ask, well, what, what's the purpose of painting the rocks? And, and it was kind of, they always just thought it was kind of like, well, here comes that crazy lady again, you know, asking all the questions. And that, but it was like, what is the purpose of it? So they were like looking at me like it was obvious, like who wants ugly rocks? We want them to be pretty. We want pretty rocks. And, and they ended up using these painted rocks as borders for their flower gardens. And, and that's what, um, you know, they, they held the structure of the soil that, you know, for their flowers, for some of their vegetable plants and, you know, the small little gardens. And that's what designated the garden. So they had quite a few of these like little plotted areas with these rock borders, but the rocks were pretty, you know, they, they didn't like the ugly rocks. Other rocks went out to do something else. You know, they threw it out in the barn or they did with something, but the, the ones that were close to being pretty that they painted beautiful, they just, um, it was just their way of, you know, putting them out to hold the, hold the structure together, but yet they look pretty. And it kind of reminds you of our churches, you know, and, and our buildings, you know, mm-hmm. we're so proud of our buildings sometimes that, you know, this structure, this rock that, that holds our foundation together, and yet it looks pretty from the outside, you know, for everyone to come and see how, how nice our building looks and, and you know, that, that structure. But really on the inside, we're kind of messy. You know, we, we are some of those odd-looking stones. You know, we've got those little growths sometimes and little, you know, lots of dirt on there. You know, we, we're not painted pretty pinks and purples and that. So, but I always just, um, I always thought of that, this, this scripture passage at this time of year, especially when I saw the wagon after a while, I kind of chuckled because I didn't go and ask the question, but they went for me to come out and help them sometimes. (laughs) Well, thank you for sharing that with us, Jackie. I think that does help us identify a little bit of how that can look now as opposed to just then historically uh, for us to help us keep us on that mode of thinking. Does anyone want to, you know, identify in the scripture why the sense of identity and encouragement is so strong? Because this scripture is coming to, to several churches, several people, um, early in identifying who they are. Does anybody want to kind of take that a little bit and and help uh, us understand the significance of that? Well, I certainly think that there's some connection in, in all of First Peter here because he's trying to uh, guide the people along this, this path in which he, you know, he begins early on by talking about being holy. And then <clears throat> he moves into this passage that we're sharing today and then follows it up in how we should live in, in, in the New International Version, the pagan world. Um, so, you know, these these steps of how we should live our lives and in this focus intentionally on uh, living stones in today's passage. Um, Peter, I think is trying to work from a, from a place where he's not just trying to transform lives, but he's trying to reshape our identities Mm kind of like Jackie's story with the rocks where they were kind of by painting them, uh, they were trying to make the ugly beautiful per se, you know, Um, but it's that whole idea where Peter is trying to help the people not only to know Christ, but to get closer by reshaping their identities. Another piece of this passage in reference to stones and the imagery that's used there, um, as Jackie referred, when we think of stones, we think quite often of our, our beautiful church buildings that are quite often made of stone or brick materials, and at least the foundation of it. Mm-hmm. And then, but it's 
in this particular passage in verse five, it says that we are the living stones. And in this part of, of Peter, in these early letters to the church, they were just establishing who they were as Christians, many of them coming out of a Jewish faith tradition. And they were trying to, to forge what it looked like to follow Christ and the teachings of Christ. And part of this was not to be so focused on the building, mm -hmm. um, to not be focused on this once just a central location of worship, but to the focus being that they were as the body of Christ, they were the ecclesia, they were the gathering, the fellowship of believers to go out into the world and to be those living stones, not one set location, but to be living stones wherever they were, whatever community, whatever context, their work, their schools, their families, their lives. And I, I think that speaks to us today because we, we still have those struggles where we love our buildings and they are certainly, they serve a greater, per, they serve a great purpose in gathering us together um, to encourage uh, a point of contact. And then we go out into our respected places. And yet right now in the midst of this, we're apart from our buildings. We, we don't have that one centered place where we can go on Sundays and meet. Um, so we're learning in many ways what it truly means to be Ecclesia in this way and what it looks like to not have, um, to have that, to, to be the living stones. When I hear stone, and we've talked about stone a lot in terms of commitment, uh, we often see a stone as being an immovable object, especially if it's big, like a, a boulder. And it, um, in some of my notes in, in my Bibles, it, it does talk about that as being a commitment. When, um, when we have a new birth, which they talk about later in First Peter, um, it's not an instant change, but it's a commitment to this new life. Just like we talked about last week, in being sheep and learning God's voice, um, it takes a commitment to learn to learn God's voice and to be in His Word and and to know that and and to not reject the stone to really be living stones that are living immovable away away from God. So we are committed to God and to. Um, and talking about and really placing Jesus as the cornerstone in our own lives so that we can be immovable from our faith. Mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. yeah. And I think it too, you know, as it talks a lot about Jesus, a lot of this comes from earlier from, from the old Testament, from um, Hosea and from Isaiah, um, those lovely rhyming books. <laughs> and uh and god giving god's people his identity that you are my people you are the witness of god's love in the world and um and in this scripture i think he's tying that together for these um new christians who had jewish roots that that you are my witness in the world and that ties into Jesus who is my bodily witness of who I am and how I am to you and that you are to be that witness out in the world and that that you um on cornerstones on buildings um especially I guess in the ancient world but I think it's true in the modern world they they set the walls by that corner. You know, you got mm -hmm. those two 90 degree angles, or even if it's one of those fancy ones that isn't a, a square or a rectangle, you, you lay the walls straight based on where that cornerstone is. And that as, as new Christians or even people who have been people of faith for a long time, for, for these early Christians, um, they were Jews before, um, 
that you need to, to guide your focus and guide your life and your witness of God's love into the world upon Jesus and, and how Jesus is working in your life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Pastor Katie, that's a, that's a great word um, to remind us that focal point of where things begin, the cornerstone, that, that if we, we can trace things back just as much as it navigates our world forward. We can trace back who we are when we walk through and see uh, Christ and, and maybe even some other saints in our life that have come alongside us and, and helped nurture us a little bit. You know, we there is such this powerful image of, of stones and living stones here in the scripture. But can I back up for a second? Because I think there's a great piece before we even get to the stones at the very beginning of this passage. Um, and, and it's kind of interesting today because um, it says clean house. A lot of us have cleaned our house uh, now that we're spending more time there. We've got to the closets and things. And, and does anyone want to share a little bit about maybe the first couple of scriptures here? Because it really leads us to a place to accept what our identity is because it tells us also who we're not and how to come expect it. Anybody want to take a, a look into why that's important to start us off in this? Well, um, I've switched my Bible app over to the New Living Translation and um, verse one was not originally part of what we were covering today, but it's always, all of scripture is always part of what we're talking about. But verse one says, so get rid of all evil behavior, be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and all unkind speech. So, and then it goes on like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk. So we must, as when we become baptized, we are, if we're baptized as adults, especially, we, we are reborn, truly. Um, and we need to be done with the, the past life and the, the deceit and the hypocrisy and the jealousy, all of that, and to go into new life, spiritually pure, like newborns. Mm-hmm. When I think about that, uh, that change that happens um, I, I have always been the person who stops to pick up the shiny rock or the different rock. And, and I, I don't know that you would be able to see it real well, but I have this, this glass jar full of all kinds of different rocks. There's Petoskey stones in there and there's fossils and there's all kinds of things. But I've got rocks from Lake Superior, which is one of my favorite places. And this one here is almost, it's like the size of a small egg and it's round. And when I think about, look at the different rocks there, but when I think about these, I think about how they are changed by the water flowing over them and the motion of the waves up on the shore and how that shapes something that had rough edges and and those bumps and knobs and things that you talked about, Jackie. But I think God works in us like this. And when we do what, what's called for in those first few verses, get rid of all the malice and the envy and the fear and the regret. You let those things go and then look at what that cornerstone is and then allow God to move in us and around us and shape us and bring us to be the person that God calls us to be. It's not so different than what the water does to the stones on the shore. Well, and along those lines too, as we um, seek to knock off all those things and to follow Jesus, we, you know, kind of calling back to last week, are we the sheep or the shepherds? We're also right. called witnesses to other people. And, and the question is, are those living stones that we are, are we building walls? Um, that are holding people back or are we building a well to make it so people can access the living water of Jesus? Um, How are we using our living stones that we are when we gather in community and, and when we are sharing um, our faith and our life with others uh, one-on-one and alone? Mm -hmm. You know, I think, too, when I read those first couple of verses and we, we take into the context that this is 60 years 
after Christ's resurrection, 60 years or so after Pentecost, after the first Pentecost. This is a spirit-driven church. And they've, I think the text takes us to the um, implication that or there, or there, uh, or the text allows us to imply that they've had an encounter with the Spirit because it says in verse, there in verse 3, um, or verse 2, like newborn babies crave spir- pure spirit, spirit, spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. They've had some sort of an encounter with the presence of God. And they're being prepared. Kim talked about baptism. They've been baptized in the Spirit. And we know that the story of Jesus reminds us that everything explodes for him post, post-baptism. post Baptism. That's when his ministry starts. And, and I think Peter is preparing this church and these, these communities uh, to go out because he's he makes that alignment that you, just as Christ was the the living stone, you now are living stones. You are, and someone, I think Heather said it, we are now the representatives of Christ in the world. Right. And, and that's where Peter, I think, is, is drawing these, these churches to. And it's opportunity for us today. And, and Heather, you made the great point. We've been locked down for seven weeks. Right. And the ministry of the church is still taking place. Yeah. Right. Lives are being impacted. Lives, pe- people are being saved. Uh, through this kind of media, um, mm-hmm. and the church doesn't stop because the doors are closed. Right. And, you know, if I could just su- suggest, because this is a real treat for me, too, in, in moderating, I get to hear so many uh, different voices look at the scripture. I'm amazed when we hear these different voices, how many layers I mean, this is a small section of scriptures, but it's layered. And if you know your word, it comes alive more. Um, and maybe in that beginning, as some of you alluded to, uh, Pastor Katie, Andrea, and, and Curtis, that um, we're molded and shaped by by God. You know, we're not left alone. We're always growing. I think it's really important if maybe somebody wants to, to pick up and talk a little bit about when we start in verse 9, because just like Scripture leads us somewhere, our relationship with Jesus leads us somewhere, it, because we're saved not just to stay, you know, new and discovering, we're meant for something, a higher calling than that. Does anybody want to kind of lean into, when we get to verse 9 and 10, that this grace, it's, it's forming us to something, it's leading us somewhere. Right. Well, I, I think that, that what you said is absolutely true, Matt. I'm looking at the message version here, the paraphrase, but you are the ones chosen by God. That's all of us. And that's the responsibility that comes when, when we are changed through baptism. And I was an adult when I was baptized. Kim, I think you mentioned that. I remember very clearly what that felt like. And when I talk to people about that, well, they, you know, they might have been a baby or, or a young child. As an adult, that, was, that truly was a life-changing experience. And I feel an obligation, a responsibility to to share that and to to speak out and to bring others to Christ and offer that same kind of forgiveness and grace that I've experienced. Yeah. And even if you were baptized as a child or a baby, it's um, you might not be baptized as um, an adult or a teenager, but you would go through confirmation and you would. Right you would make that commitment at that time. And that is just as life changing. Yes. Making that commitment as a a teenager or um, as an adult, just joining a church or declaring that you are here and part of the church. That is just as life changing. So don't discount the fact that you were baptized as a a baby as not being able to have that life changing moment. No. And I don't, I think every time we remember our baptism, absolutely. Every time we do that, we are we are experiencing that we are experiencing that grace again. No, absolutely. Yep. Well, absolutely. and I can kind of speak to that because I was one of those who was baptized as an infant. I have no memory of my baptism. No. <laughs> but when I was a lay speaker before I became a pastor, I went back to the church that I grew up in. 
Um, and I got to preach to all the saints of the church who had been there when I was a baby. Um, and one of the dear old saints of the church, Ralph Weigel, came up to me and he said, and I'm getting goosebumps even, and little Terry to even mention it, and I've told this story a bunch of times. He said, I remember writing your name on the cradle roll, and I remember saying the vows at your baptism. And what a powerful witness right. to me. And, and as a pastor, too, I think it speaks to how we stand in each other's stead and each other's footsteps. You know, when, um, you know, and Ralph Weigel has gone to glory since then. But when um, we say those vows at the baptism, right. you know, those people at Redford where I grew up, you know, they're not there supporting me in my faith journey right now, although, you know, I see them on Facebook, but the people that are in my churches now, you know, or that I'm standing for people who are baptized in another church and helping support their faith journey. As those living stones, we are holding each other up, even if maybe we weren't there at the building of the foundation. Right. I think the, the last two verses can also really speak to the time we're in and the fact that if we go with that idea of Peter not only trying to transform our lives but reshape our identity, I mean, it tells us that we're, you know, we're God's special possession. You know, we're a chosen people, and it's uh, the praise of him who called you out of the darkness into this wonderful light. So this period that we're in kind of metaphorically representing that darkness and God pulling us out into the light, therefore leading into that last verse where it's like once we weren't a people, but now we're a people. We, you know, we, we thought we were a people in our buildings and now that we're outside of them, we're having to become another group of people. Our identity has been reshaped. And so there we go into uh, the fact that we have received mercy, you know, and, and so we have another opportunity not only for ourselves to be reshaped, but to reshape those that maybe we have been disconnected from or mm -hmm. those that haven't yet began this journey for us to reach them maybe through this platform or some other way to, to help them see the word that is being shared with us today being built on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You yeah, know, good, good word, uh, Pastor Matt. We appreciate that uh, because it is. It, it leads us to, to that growth and that we give others a taste of what we've had. We see that life-changing work of grace in us. Uh, Jackie, do you have anything that you want to share? I know you shared a story earlier, but as far as that transformation, uh, Matt just talked about, you know, that it, that it all gets poured in and then we come out of that and pour into other people. Do you want to touch on that a little bit in the scripture? Sure. I mean, to go along with what Matt was saying about being poured out, I mean, and talking about what, you know, others are saying about the baptism. And I mean, and, and there's so many of us that maybe have stepped away and, you know, or stumble along the way. And, and it's, you know, those times that you come back and you realize the beauty of um, what the baptism meant, you know, and, and that's another way to appreciate the baptism of, you know, what those words meant and, you know, that washing again, you know, it's only one baptism, but I mean, still that, that washing, you know, as you put your hands through it, remembering that washing through the waters. And, and it's just, um, yes, I just, um, I, I think that, you know, there's so many times in our lives that we, you know, we can remember those times and we're being polished off. Remember those times when we're supposed to be that stone for others who, who just are seeking those who are just, you know, wondering those who have, you know, been, turned away themselves and it's just you know we need to remember how we need to be that stone or that person they're holding the the rag wiping them off and taking off those rough edges sometimes and and doing that so you know cleaning them up and just making them polished and just feeling god's love on them yeah excellent um thank you for that uh, pastor heather before we close this this time of of this uh, scripture um, do you have anything that you wanted to, to kind of put as a wrapping note or as we attempt to land the plane, as the phrase goes, is there anything that you wanted to kind of punctuate with us before we, we move on to the rest of our service? I think the thing that stands out in this scripture to me is to be, to be the living stone means that we're living our lives in Christ. Um, 
and that we're alive in what we do. We're not stones that are just set in place, whether they're put on a porch and they're painted or they're a cornerstone for a building or they're a memorial to something that has passed, but we are alive in Christ with the message of hope and grace and love alive to express that to those who are around us and to be filled, to go out and to be that light in the midst of darkness. Excellent reminder for us. God is not finished with us yet. Even though we're in some uncertain days, not by a long shot. We're still being shaped and polished today. And it's good to be shaped and polished with all of you here today and joining us. Um, I think that concludes our time now for uh, wrestling and identifying with the scripture. And let us move on now. We're going to share in something today. And it's a, it's a love feast. Um, many of you may have experienced communion before in church, but this is a little bit different. Um, this is not communion. This is something that we'll share together, and we have a, a description of what we're doing, and Katie and I are going to read that. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we have all come to this place frail and broken. In a world dealing with the pandemic and our human responses to it, fear, worry, sorrow, anger, hate, greed, and isolation, in a church searching to find the way forward, we seek to find healing through this restorative service of old. It is in this agape fest feast where adversaries become friends, friends become neighbors, and the Christian family embraces everyone. We are not doing communion in this season of being safe at home because as United Methodists, we believe that we encounter God as much in the gathered community of faith as we do in the elements of the bread and the cup. And so today we are going to be doing something that's going to be new for many of us. If you have not gathered something to eat and to drink before now, I invite you to find those things and join with us in this ancient celebration as generations of Christians have done throughout our history. In the Gospels, we read the story of the meal that Jesus shared with his disciples on the night that he was betrayed before his arrest and execution. That is what we celebrate in Holy Communion. But we have many other stories in the Gospels of Jesus sharing meals with his disciples, not only with the Twelve, but with more than 5,000 with loaves and fishes, drinking water beside a well with a Samaritan woman, lunch with a tax collector named Zacchaeus, a wedding feast in Cana, a dinner party with a Pharisee, and in intimate gatherings of family and friends and followers, and hundreds of other meals that were not described in scripture. Love feasts celebrate those fellowship gatherings. A few hundred years ago, John and Charles Wesley encountered German Moravians in Georgia, having a service of shared food, prayer, religious conversations, and hymns, and resurrecting this beautiful and ancient practice. And ever since then, love feasts have been a part of who we are as United Methodists, although I don't think we get to do them as often as we ought to. The history of the feast as a celebration born simply out of love, generosity, and fellowship is appropriate in any time or place or with anyone and can nourish the hearts and souls of Christians in so many ways. At its most basic, the love feast is an experience of warmth and sharing, a, commem a commemoration of the early church. At its most symbolic, the love feast is a means of God's grace that is experienced in the fellowship with each other and with God. 
But the simplest explanation of the love feast is that it is a way to remember Christ's presence on earth and to celebrate with gratitude the spirit of God's love. The agape or love feast that all of us hopefully should have in front of us in our homes uh, should be some food and some drink. I invite you to gather that up. Um, one of the great things about love feasts is that there aren't as many rules or traditions around it like Holy Communion has. You can use for the love feast whatever food or drink you happen to have around. It could be coffee or I have tea here or maybe orange juice or water. Um, I think somebody said they had chocolate milk or maybe cookies <laughs> or a muffin or pretzels or even pizza <laughs> left over from last night's supper. You don't have to have the church gathered there. It can be whoever it is there with you and Jesus. And there doesn't even need to be a clergy pres person present. It can be children or adults because it's a time of nourishment and fellowship. And so let us commemorate our unity through Christ and feast on the spirit of love that we share through Christ. Now, this time that we have had uh, seven weeks at home, um, some of us are with the same people that we have been uh, cooped up with, I'll say, uh, and maybe we've gotten a little short, maybe a little crabby with each other when, you know, somebody didn't pick their socks up off the floor or they didn't clean up their dishes after supper, and, and maybe we've used some unkind words with each other, or maybe you're somebody who isn't having to live with other people, but maybe you're alone, and and maybe you've said some unkind things to yourself. Usually our inner voice is maybe the meanest critic that we have. And, and so as we are gathered together, we are gathered with Jesus. And I invite you to take a little time with the people who you are living with, or if you're alone, I think it's high time you and Jesus have a conversation and and that you ask Jesus to remind you of how loved he, how much love he has for you, how he sees you, how you are a wonderful and glorious creation of God, and how you are amazing in all that you do in your day. And, and maybe we need to um, say some I'm sorry's to people around us and, and build each other up remind each other how we love each other and and how much we are loved and so i invite you to take some time and and share in your love feast whatever it is that you are drinking and eating and during this time as we um do those things that we have talked about at the beginning of first peter that first little verse there as we get rid of that um criticism and harshness in our life. Um, part of love feasts is also uh, some witness and some testimony. And so we have a testimony to be shared as we're eating and drinking. Well, thank you, Pastor Katie. Um, as you all enjoy your feast, I will uh, share a few words uh, so you can uh, chew and swallow uh, before we finish with our service today. Um, but uh, we uh, we gather the evening before as a group, and uh, we we brainstorm and we discuss how we want to approach uh, our passage for the week. And one of the things that we discussed last night was in verse eight about the idea that a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall, uh, they stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. And so the question came up, does that mean we have to stay there though? And, and I'm here to say no. Uh, my own testimony is that of one where, uh, like many, I, I stepped away from the church for a number of years. And there were certainly uh, times during those years away where I felt as if maybe I wasn't um, good enough to return or that I was concerned if I did return, you know, because I had stumbled, would I be welcome back? And so uh, as, as we, you know, continue to talk about living stones and 
you know, and Andrea's analogy with the rocks from Lake Superior, we're continually reshaped and our identity evolves uh, because Christ isn't done with us, as Heather said as well. Uh, and, and I'm so thankful and grateful, and I can't show enough gratitude to God every day other than to serve him and to uh, give him praise for, for redeeming me, for saving my life again, and allowing me this uh, beautiful opportunity with my brothers and sisters in Christ here to uh, continue to share the good news uh, and let you know that, that we, all, we all have our moments when we stumble. Some, are, some of them are bigger than others. Um, you know, and, and sometimes we fall harder, but it doesn't mean that we can't pick ourselves back up. And, uh, you know, if we continue to allow ourselves to listen to what God is trying to tell us to be our good shepherd and to uh, continue to be that living stone that uh, grows and moves and reshapes itself so that we can uh, represent the light and the darkness, it's, it's an incredible journey in which we invite all who uh, might not have started this journey to join us. And uh, for those of you that have already uh, taken that first step, uh, be sure to share your story. You know, we use words like testimony and evangelism and people get scared and you don't need to be. All we're doing is telling our story. And so uh, as you take this time with your loved ones or those nearby that you may be sharing this feast with, or even if it's just a conversation between you and God, uh, continue to give praise and thank God for the opportunity to uh, be able to move forward in this time that uh, may be a little bit tougher, where we might need to say sorry a little bit more, and we might need to be a little kinder to those that are near us that have been around us in close quarters for seven weeks. Uh, allow, allow you as that, that living stone in your house to continue to uh, you know, evolve so that uh, Christ can work through you and, and share that message with others once we can get back out into the world. This is a time that we enter into prayer, and I will offer a prayer, and then I invite you to join us in the Lord's Prayer at the end. Let us pray. Redeeming God, placing our trust in your faithfulness, we bring you our prayers for the world. We pray for the church here and around the world, that it may be built on solid rock and strengthened in times of challenge. We pray for the gift of faith, that we may be nurtured by your word to love our neighbors far and near. We pray for the healthcare professionals who are giving so much of themselves to care for the sick in this time of pandemic. Strengthen them to do the vital work to which you have called them. We pray for all who struggle in the storms of life, in relationships, in finances, in work, or in health. We pray for those who suffer, that our care for them may be a new incarnation. We pray for the earth, and we ask for wisdom to use its resources wisely as good stewards. May you, your living word show us how to love you and our neighbors above all else. As always, God, we pray for peace in our communities, our state, our nation, and around the world. Joined with Christ, in the communion of the Holy Spirit, we praise and glorify your name now and forever. Hear us now as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us Give this, us day, this day, our day our daily, daily bread, bread. And, forgive and forgive us our, us trespasses, our trespasses, as we forgive, forgive those, those who trespass, who trespass against, against, us. against us. And lead us and not, lead us into, not temptation, into temptation, but deliver, but deliver us, us from, evil. from evil. For thine, thine is the kingdom, the kingdom 
and the power, and the, power, and the, glory, and the glory forever. forever. Amen. Amen. There were walls between us. By the cross you came and broke them down. You broke them down. There were chains around us. By your grace we are no longer bound. No longer bound. You call me out of the grave. You call me into the light. You call my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. As we uh, conclude our service today, take this blessing with you. Go now and celebrate wherever God's name is honored. When suffering comes, pray in faith. In times of joy, sing songs of praise. Preserve in prayer and action, persevere in prayer and action to bring the fallen back to the truth. And may God save you from all that would harm you. May Christ Jesus heal you and raise you up. And may the Holy Spirit anoint you and give you peace with one another. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen.